Ты не Я Я
why I like using metaphors. And this works really well with horror as well because horror allows for a lot of different layers of interpretation and meaning. When things aren't necessarily what they seem on the surface and when there's light to be found in and through dark subjects. So uh, this brings us to the game I'm working on currently. It's called Exodai Ragnarok and it's a virtual reality horror game. And uh, well, I guess I'll tell you a little bit about what Ragnarok actually is. Uh, Ragnarok is from Norse mythology and it's um, basically the end of the world, the twilight of the gods. This is where the, the world ends and all the gods and all the people die. But the thing is that it's not time is not uh, time is not linear in Norse mythology. It's cyclical. So uh, when things are destroyed, they come back and are created again. And this was kind of uh, this is a very important thing that I tried to bring to the artwork when I uh, worked with the game. It's a first-person game, and uh, obviously it's a virtual reality game. We use the Oculus Rift, and uh, in the beginning you are thrown into this crazy wilderness, this wasteland, and you don't really know what's happening, and uh, the only thing that you uh, know is that the goddess Freya has summoned you to find her necklace, which was stolen. And in order to kind of explain how I create the visuals and the aesthetic for the game, it's important to talk about what it's like to work with VR in general. Um, so, as I said, we work with uh, Oculus Rift, the FQ2, so I'll mostly focus on that, and I mean, this stuff will probably also apply to other uh, VR devices, but uh, it's important to kind of keep in mind that you know, some things are very Oculus specific. Um, so for those of you who haven't tried the Rift yet, you basically put on the head, head mounted display and it shows you two little, uh, uh, two little uh, like screens for each eye. And this is what gives you this, uh, this illusion of depth. Right, because that's how you see normally. You see things from two, two you get input from two, uh, two eyes. Um, and then you uh, get your, uh, your headphones on and they give you a PlayStation 3 controller and you navigate by uh, physically turning. It's a, it's a stand-up VR game. And, sorry, just It's a stand-up VR game, so we want you to physically move when you're navigating. And uh, through the PS3 controller, you uh, use the sticks to go forward and backward, and you can shoot by pressing X. All right, so with video games, you already have uh, a lot of ways to engage the player compared to a lot of different, uh, a lot of other forms of media, right? You have sound, you have visuals, you have the story. Most importantly, you have interaction, which is, uh, you know, the, it's very interesting to work with as a developer, but it's also really tricky. And with VR, you have another layer, which is, uh, you know, this technology allows you to make it even more, uh, if you can pull it off, it can be, it can be really uh, even more engaging. So the, the reason uh, that this happens is because you can't really see or hear anything perfectly uh, when you have the device on, so you're completely isolated. Your peripheral vision is no longer your desk, your room, uh, what's happening on your table, your Coke bottles, uh, you can't hear your mom telling you to take out the trash, whatever. Um, and this is when uh, we start talking about immersion, right? And immersion is one of these big fluffy words that people really like to throw around. But what I would like to point out is that it's really difficult to promise that anybody will be immersed. And it's very difficult to predict if anybody will be immersed. So um, I'm going to give you the definition of immersion. And this is from Janet Murray. The sensation of being surrounded by a completely other reality, where we lose awareness of the real world and we lose track of time. This is, like, this is what we want to achieve, right? But as I said, it's very difficult to predict. And the best that we can do uh, is to kind of try to, um, try to get the tech out of the way so that people can have a chance at it. So I'm going to play you a little video. This is basically from my personal point of view. I mean, immersion or not, something's really working with VR. And I'm going to kind of play this to illustrate what we've seen, what happens at our booth. Oops. The sound isn't working.
those people. We know people have an age. <laughs> Your head. And also, you want to kind of, I don't know, we, we've 
decided to avoid jump scares because, first of all, I feel like it cheapens the, the experience a little bit, but also uh, it's not the kind of game that we're, we want to make. It's an exploration horror game, so we, we want to make sure that people are creeped out in a different way. Uh, and also, like, jump scares on the Oculus are just really tough because people already have a tendency to lose balance if things are not 100% like stable. And if you make them like actively lose balance, it's just, you know, they're gonna fall over. Or die! Mm -hmm. I found three articles uh, that say that horror games are expected to cause the first virtual reality death. So there's something to aim for. Okay, so uh, as an art director, aesthetically, uh, it's sort of my job to enhance the world so that it's, it's perceived as a real place and to support immersion. And that process is actually not that different from designing games uh, that are not for VR, but there are, you have to keep in mind uh, the technology you're working at and, and, and like, that it's possible to do a lot of more things and a lot of different kinds of things uh, with VR. So, uh, first of all, people tend to look and listen in a different way when they're wearing this stuff. So, you can place things around them, you can kind of like, you can uh, hide things in, in more places than just, you know, a little bit off, off the center of the screen, for example, which is the tendency, usually. Um, and, uh, you know, you can really tailor the experience more to people's uh, ability to sense to hear and see. So, can anyone tell me what's the number one goal for creating a horror game? Like, if you're, if you want to create a horror game, what's the one thing that you want to think of? Yes. What? Yes. Tension. Good. Anybody else? How to scare people. How to scare people. Yes, but how do you do that? In a word. Make them believe. Make them uneasy. Make them uneasy. Makes them feel threatened. Pretty good, yeah. Or this. <laughs> no, uh, it's it's vulnerability. So most of you got it right. You basically have to make your player feel like they, they have something to lose, that they're weak and they they are underpowered, and there's a lot of like a lot of things out to get them basically. And uh, yeah, they usually have to run and hide or use their intellect to survive rather than like shoot their enemies down and, you know, progress that way. Uh, so my job as art director is to make graphics that support this and make the game world appeal, uh, appear believable and to trigger players' imaginations because more often what, sh what the player is uh, imagining themselves is going to be a lot scarier to them than what you present to them clearly. So it's about framing the game in a way that uh, supports this. Like you, there are a lot of things that you can hide from the player and not show clearly, and that will really creep them out, as opposed to like sticking a monster in their face, right? And the VR actually helps a lot with that because, first of all, there's the greater sense of the unknown uh, because you have you know, your peripheral vision is in the, is like how you see in real life. Uh, so things can actually creep up on you really fast and you will have nowhere to go because you can't like back away from the screen, you have to yank off the Oculus. So if we get practical here, I'm going to show you how I do the visuals for the Ragnarok game. So first of all, with VR, it's all about staging and dramatics for me, which means it's very much about level design. So you want to create suspense, and you want to set up the right scenes in the right places to give people the right experience. And the way you do this is obviously through dramatic arcs and things like that, and uh, that means that you kind of take away a little bit of uh, the player's uh, control, or like free freedom. Um, and the, the story is almost always pre-scripted in horror games, so there's this, like, there's this fine line that you have to kind of balance out. Uh, and aesthetically, I really like to use a style leaning towards realism because uh, it's easier for people to connect to things that look more real uh, and to kind of connect to the experience more emotionally. So for example, the canyon that I drew here translates to something like this. By the way, we're still in alpha, so this is not polished at all. But um, the thing is, it, it looks like it could be a real place and uh, at the same time, it's also highly dramatized, right? 
uh, especially when you don't see the sizes at first, but have to look up and you get this kind of effect. And that's because complete realism is often not as evocative. So uh, an example is the, the explosions in space from like Star Wars and, and movies like that. Obviously, it's not like it's not realistic, but we do it anyway because it really supports uh, uh, the narrative. You also really want to think about colors and uh, color temperature when you are um, designing this stuff. Uh, colors really easily evoke feelings and emotions and can be used symbolically. So for example, you can create uh, different kinds of environments just by using the colors, pretty much. Like you can make really uncomfortably hot or uncomfortably cold environments. You can use uh, really dusty and desaturated colors to make the environment appear um, less like inhabited and uh, more kind of like abandoned. And uh, you can use uh, signal colors, like strong contrast colors, to as a as a mechanic first of all, but also to draw people's attention to where you want them to uh, go, like where you, where you want to predict they're going to go. So you can kind of control players' attentions that way. You can also uh, use the lighting, obviously. Lighting is very, very important for horror games. You can create really dramatic effects. Uh, using, for example, shadows to limit people's field of vision is very often used. Uh, and also creating like safe and unsafe zones through the light and dark. And then there's environment art in general. This is probably one of the more important things um, that we're doing in our game. Um, like, environment art for VR is really essential because we don't have, at least for us, because we don't have a UI. So everything is happening through the level design. We don't, like, uh, people's visual guidance is going to happen through the environment. So you have to really think about staging and think about what are your focal points and uh, giving people a visual direction. And this, like I said before, it can kind of get you to a little bit predict at least where the, the player is going to go and where, they're, where they'll be drawn uh, towards. Uh, it can also affect pacing. It can create really fast-paced, intense uh, situations or slow-paced uh, breathing rooms through the environment art. Or you can um, yeah, pretty much create credibility for the world. That's, that's the most important thing, I think. So what I do? When I, um, when I work with this stuff practically, is first of all, I figure out the feeling after I've got the concept down and know what kind of like, uh, what this area is supposed to um, show, basically, in the game. So I, I figure out the feeling. Some places are designed to make you feel claustrophobic. Some places are designed to make you feel uh, alone and lost, or stressed out and chased, or uh, like this one. Uh, is made to make you feel really kind of like small and uh, confused and also very, very lost. And uh, obviously the environment also tells you about the degree of hostility um, in the game. You can, if you play your cards really well, you can get the player to imagine that they're, um, the place is alive. Like the, the entire place is actually alive enough to get them. And inanimate objects as well. And it's not just, you know, th th there are kind of enemies that they can see, or they're alone, but they're at the same time not alone. So uh, things that, tips and tricks for that is often also used in horror games. Uh, the infestation and the decay and the ruins, which are like, yeah, I guess, I guess they're really cliche at this point, but like, uh, the reason that people use them is because it tells you something about the environment. It tells you about the limited functionality of the environment, that you can't really trust it, and that there's like there's possibly evil forces out there. Uh, also, you want to think about geometrical shapes. Uh, so, like, pretty basic, but things like uh, pointy and angular shapes are going to make people more uncomfortable than like round and soft forms. Just, it sounds kind of weird when you split it up that way, but it actually works. Um, yeah, and then there's the uncanny. Which is really hard to do, but when you do it, it's, it completely freaks people out. Uh, it's when you show that something's really off about the environment. So Stephen King has this really cool quote. Uh, 
When you come home and notice that everything you own has been taken away and replaced by an exact substitute. That feeling, right? You want to you wanna give people that feeling of something's really off and I can't really put, put my finger on it. And another uh, more, I guess, overused example would be uh, like haunted mansions or, or mansions that seem regular when you go into them and then inside you find out that there's a lot of traps or there's a lot of uh, there's a maze or something like that that's completely strange and you start, you know, your player starts thinking about uh, things like a detective. They try to figure out uh, what actually is going on here. Like, they try to, you know, you, you start thinking, is this place made to keep me out or to keep something in? Like, that's, that's where you want people to, to go <coughs> mentally. Uh, obviously, the environment is also, um, uh, you know, limiting the field of vision through the environment is also very, very important. Uh, you can use fog or labyrinths or shadows for that. And then there's the visual semantics, basically what your environment is com communicating, like uh, the meaning that, sh that parts of your environment are communicating about who its inhabitants are or who's been there before. Things you can use are traces of blood, um, broken bones or broken objects or letters, secret documents. Uh, and in here we use cave paintings to tell the story. So basically things that will make the place look like it's functional, right? It, it's been lived in, it has a purpose. And then there's character design, which is also extremely important. So for horror games, um, traditionally, your enemy characters are going to hinder your player in accomplishing their goal. You're gonna either, you have to either avoid them or uh, overcome them in some kind of other way. And basically, uh, we have here an example from our game. It's the Yotun character. And the Yotunar were a tribe of ancient spiritual beings in Norse mythology. And they were very feared, but at the same time they were not evil, which is also a big distinction from, uh, you know, between Norse mythology and uh, the monotheistic religions that we know. They tried to always drag civilization back to its primordial chaos, and the gods were uh, more symbolizing uh, the light and the, and the order in the world. So they were actually a part of the cosmos and, and this fight between chaos and creation. And uh, it was therefore important to me that none of these characters that I create for the game are purely evil or purely good, that they have to be more complex than that. And so uh, this Yosun is actually, uh, the name Yosun means devourer, or thorn-like, or powerful and injurious. The name also has some connections to the words eat, or glutton, and matter, and so at first it was kind of characterized by the desire to consume, right? And then I started looking for references. And these were my main references, I would say. The first is uh, Francisco Goya, Saturn devouring his sons. And I mean, something really, really striking about this painting, the, the, the kind of like blind consumption and this kind of like blank expression in the middle of consumed flesh. And it's the same thing if you've ever seen a shark eat. It's kind of like this this rage and this blindness in the middle of doing something so terrible that's really uh, spoke to me. So I tried to kind of transfer that uh, to the character and we ended up with something that's from a distance could appear to be human, but then when you get closer by, you realize that he has no face. Uh, he has no eyes on his face, and his face is mainly like consisting of huge gums and teeth. And so his, his, uh, his skin is pale like that of a drawn man, and he's constantly in this state of looking for things to eat and devour. And so this was actually kind of tragic for me. That it, it's not like, uh, the character is not really like evil evil to me. It's, uh, there's kind of a tragedy in in this character, and and that's I think that's psychologically also what makes him really frightening to me, at least, uh, because you can kind of understand the point of view of the villain, or at least uh, see the that they are also suffering, 
that makes them even more, uh, I don't know, creepy, I guess. And it's also, you know, I, I think the reason for that, the reason that that spoke to me is because uh, I feel that like even the most horrible people in history have been children once and they've had people who love them and people, you know, mothers and fathers and stuff like that. And that's, that's the really creepy part to me. So I tried to kind of transfer that to, uh, to my characters. Okay, so let's do a recap. Uh, this is where we get hashtag D. So to me, to me, creating graphics for VR horror is pretty much uh, the most important thing is to know your technology, right? Know what you're dealing with, and know your device, and understand how to work with it, and not work against it. But also, it's important uh, from a more, I guess, philosophical point of view to retain the complexity when you're making the horror. Uh, experience or more of aesthetics. So nothing is purely evil and nothing is purely good. There's this, this it's this complexity when uh, the lightness and dark meet, darkness and light meet, uh, where you have like this interesting thing that happens, right? So it's also very relevant, like, uh, especially for this game because in Norse mythology, as I said many times before, the, the chaos and creation are really deep and linked, so you want to kind of preserve that. And so, yeah, I guess that concludes my talk, and uh, I guess what I really want people to take away from this is that VR has a lot of potential, and it really depends on what you do with it. And I think, especially for horror games, it's, it's a really good medium. And for, um, you know, especially for graphic artists and art directors like me, it's, it's, a, it's a joy to play with, but it's also, you know, it can be a really, really hard thing to get your head around because it's such a new medium. Anyways, I hope you're, you can take something away from this talk and then we can make some kick-ass things. Thank you. <laughs> so, I'll be taking questions and Julie will set up a play case. And if we have uh, any volunteers that want to try it out. Hey, okay, we got our first volunteer. monster really clearly. You want to kind of keep them always a little bit hidden or, or it's, you want to, like for example, we have this cape level that we're currently implementing. It's, you have this thing chasing you in the dark and you're not really sure what it is. And this is also where audio becomes extremely important because it's the sounds that you hear that tell you about the hostility of the creature, right? So yeah, that's uh, using, using your environment graphically. Yeah, okay, so right now, as I said, we have a prototype of it. It's, it's leaning towards being a jump scare, but in the future we'll um, go a lot more into like making it more, even more about the sounds. Like you won't see the, the creature until very, very late in the level. So it's, it's about also constantly like preserving this, uh, this grip on your people, like your players. You want to you wanna constantly keep them uh, or, like, uh, have this pacing between like giving them something to really worry about and then let them breathe and then give them something to really worry about and then let them breathe. It's this alternation. Right. I guess also another thing is that we moved it from being more of an action game to more information of more. Mm -hmm. uh, and also because of some of the limitations with VR, because this uh, is different year a year ago, people were moving about a lot and I particularly had to hold people. Whereas we figured out, okay, this is not necessarily going to work in the long run. Yes, any other questions? Yes? Thank you. 